Welcome to the Grant Writing Simplified Podcast. This is the place to learn how to make a big impact in your community through grant writing and nonprofit consulting. The world needs you to step forward as a grant writer and use your skills to lead with confidence. I'm Teresa Huff, former special ed teacher turned grant writer and nonprofit strategist. In my 20 years of freelancing, I've helped nonprofits triple their funding and exponentially increase their reach. Now I'm stepping up to mentor freelancers and nonprofit leaders like you who are ready to take your skills to the next level. It's time to get intentional about your vision so you can create lasting change in your community. Learn the skills and strategies you need to become the grant writer the world needs. Let's do this. Welcome to episode 27 of Grant Writing Simplified. My friends, I have some good stuff for you today. The next couple of episodes are on the importance of mentoring. If you didn't catch last week's, make sure to go back later and listen to episode 26. I talk about some unexpected places where I've found mentors over the years. And get this, some of them didn't even know it. And I also share five ways to find mentors of your own. It's interesting how a topic sometimes pops up in several random places at one time. That's how this mentoring subject was once I decided to do this series on mentoring. I can't emphasize enough how instrumental mentors have been in my journey, not just in grant writing, but with business, parenting, decision making, and just life in general. That's one big reason I'm providing mentoring now to other grant writers. I know what a difference it made for me, so I want to pay it forward. I can't write all the grants for all the wonderful causes out there, but I can teach others, and so together we can create a much bigger ripple effect. I've gotten so many emails and messages from people wanting to learn grant writing, some who have even read the books and maybe even taken a course or two, and they're still saying, but where do I start? That's why I'm really excited to announce that the doors are officially open for the spring cohort of my VIP program, Fast Track to Grant Writer. This is a small group experience that teaches you exactly where to start and helps you polish up your online presence so you are ready to roll. It's challenging, it's fast, and it's fun. The winter group is wrapping up now and it's been completely amazing. This is seriously a group of rock stars that I'm about to turn loose on the world. You'll hear from them in a couple of weeks on the show. I keep these groups small so you can get lots of feedback from me throughout the program. If you'd like to snag your spot for the spring cohort, get the details and sign up today at teresahuff.com VIP. Speaking of mentors, I've also had several who helped me along the way of this podcasting journey. To quote one of those in particular who happens to be longtime pro podcaster Denise Griffiths, she says, my podcast guests are my mentors. That really stuck with me, and I found this to be true too, especially with today's guest just in our short interview together. Dr. Jonathan Krauss is on the show today. He's the founder and president of Love Never Fails International. He has plenty of credentials to his name a Rutgers University grad, Doctor of Ministry, a PhD in counseling. Although his work is impressive, John is no stranger to challenges. As a teenager, he started using drugs, which led to dropping out of school at 14, incarcerated at 15, and shot at three times by 16. Then at age 19, God radically saved him and his life had a complete turnaround. He was soon involved in the children's ministry at his church. Since then, his story has been an incredible journey of faith and leadership. In 2010, God called Jonathan to work with the children on the streets of Mumbai. A former college professor and grade school teacher in the USA, he left the comforts of home to start the nonprofit. Love Never Fails is now serving children from coast to coast in India, meeting children's needs physically, emotionally, and spiritually. John has some incredibly inspiring and encouraging words for us today, so listen and enjoy. John, welcome to the show. It's great to have you today, and I'm excited to hear more about your work and for you to share with everyone what you're doing. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here. You have a really interesting background. 
Yes. Well, back in 2009, everything was going great. And a friend, they invited me over to their house to watch a movie. And the movie was Slumdog Millionaire. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a heart touching movie. And for me, it was life changing. So that's what catapulted me into the nonprofit world. Otherwise, it was never on my radar. I was a teacher. My career was set. So I thought. Interesting. It's amazing how just one small everyday thing, like a movie with friends, can be the catalyst to change your whole life trajectory. That's really cool. So then how did you get started in international nonprofit work? Did you decide from the beginning to go international or did you start locally and it sort of grew into that? Uh, well, you know, for me, the movie Slumdog Millionaire, because it was the children in India, the challenges that they faced living in the slums and also being on the streets, I knew for me that it was going to be India. And so that's what catapulted me into the international side. Take us behind the scenes of what your organization does and how it's making a difference in the community. Yes. Well, I want to share about a little girl. Her name is Karuna. Karuna was rejected by her father from a small girl. And she used to cry thinking that she was the reason why her father had left the house. And in India, when you're born, you live in the slums and you have no father, you have no earner. So her mom was already very old when she had her. And she had health issues with uh, diabetes. And it really put them into a bad situation. So when one of our staff members first encountered Karuna, she was living in a little slum hut made of tin shack. So just imagine having a tin roof and it's 120 degrees, fully sunny outside. It's like an oven. She didn't even have a fan. Wow. They were so poor that they didn't even have pots and pans to cook any food in. So the staff member heard about her because people in the community, they know the work that Love Never Fails International does. They went there, talked with the mom, got her enrolled in a program, pending that she would get a sponsor to support her, which she did. And then after she got her sponsorship, she was enrolled in the school because she was not going to school at eight years old. She actually would just stay home and the mom would send her out to sell different types of things or she'd have to go on the streets begging to try to bring something back for the family. Now she's in school full time. She has the backing of Love Never Fails International, a sponsor to help her out, and does other things at her home when now she has a fan, at least can blow some cool air on her when it's 120 and the humidity, like a warm, hot, uh, humid day in Florida. And she has all pots and pans that from her sponsor that went out of her way and personally bought her about $450 worth. And a, stove to cook in and a gas connection. So that's what we do. We look for kids that are in very difficult situations. I like to say the work that we do is difficult because we're in the miracle business. So every day we see miracles happen. That sounds incredibly practical and hands-on, something that a sponsor across the ocean can make a huge practical difference that can really change her life. Absolutely. It really, it's real. And it's, it's so impactful for these children. But also we've been getting a, a lot of testimonies from our sponsors back and just saying, like we had one just the other day I was sharing in the office, somebody had tested positive for COVID and they were really down and bummed about it. You know, you have to quarantine, you can't be around your family. And they went to their mailbox and they pulled out their new child sponsorship letter. First one, just sponsored a kid recently, and they said their spirits just were so lifted up when they saw the smiles of this little girl in India and read her letter that she wrote her. Uh, so it even helps with COVID. <laughs> right. That's an example where it does just as much good for the person giving as the one receiving. It's a blessing on both sides. That's right. So money truly is the answer to happiness. It's just not how we always thought. It's giving it away. Right. That's a good point. And you don't always expect it in the ways we stereotypically would. As you were saying that about the heat and her home situation, that reminds me of in education where we learn about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if your basic physical needs aren't met, you can't really concentrate on the higher level things like 
a math assignment or your homework, the things you need to be doing with your brain because your physical body is out of whack, whether you're hungry, you're tired, whatever it is. So taking care of those physical needs helps them move into a higher level of thinking and the ability to learn. It builds their capacity for that by taking care of some of those basic things. That's right. That is true. I 100% agree. Like, for example, you know, a child, you know, I didn't start off wanting to feed kids and have feeding programs. That was never my plan when I started this organization, Love Never Fails International. It was helping kids to get into school. But I found out very early on that if a kid is not fed properly, then their body is susceptible to disease. They're not going to feel that energetic. And I saw it and I saw it happening. So now at our centers, we implement feeding programs because we want the kids to have a nourished mind, a strong body, and not constantly be out of school because they're sick. They're already living in very, you know, high disease risk areas with, surrounded by sewage. You know, there's a lot of sicknesses that they face. For one, one of our biggest challenges is tuberculosis. Most people don't know, but last year, 1.5 million people died of tuberculosis. That's the same as COVID. Probably about, it's about similar for COVID in a year. And yet that was just last year. So it's a big thing in India and it impacts the poor. Right. And just the sanitization measures. I mean, we have hand dispensers, hand sanitizer all over the place now. You walk into a store, it's on every corner. At schools, it's everywhere. But I'm sure in a lot of their environments, they don't even have access to that or running water, let alone soap and some of those things that they need just for basic prevention. That's true. 99% of the people, that's my guesstimation, but I'm sure it's pretty accurate. Do not even use toilet paper in India because that's another added expense that most people can't afford. Wow. So when I first came there and had a hand sanitizer and I went into a school, an English school, and I was using it before I ate lunch, I went to give it to the kids and they put it on their hands, they wiped it, then they went and then they washed their hands off with water because they didn't know what it was. They've never seen it before. They didn't realize it was the cleaner. Mm. That's right. That's right. So education is is a big thing you know not just the abcs and the one two threes but just general knowledge that a lot of people don't have that i find in extreme poverty in india i see that as the case with a lot of nonprofits they start because they want to help with this core issue and that's important but what they find after they get into it like you're saying is you really have to back up a few steps to get to the root issue before you can help with that core issue that you started out to help you've got to back up a little bit yes yes no you you learn as you go you can't expect to have everything figured out you know, just like us leaders in a nonprofit, some might say, hey, I would like to fund that. Can I give X large amount of money each month for that program? Well, if you don't have it, you know what? We'll figure it out. If it fits within our mission, let's figure it out and let's move forward. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to take step by step and try to figure it out. And I think that's how it is. Like, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. So true. And I think. That, that has got us started to take little steps. And I think people out there listening to this podcast that want to start a nonprofit, they think they have to have it all together. They don't. Just take a step and then learn it little by little. Yes, so true. And that's something I've been trying to emphasize in my grant writer coaching group as well is action brings clarity. But you've got to start, you've got to take action in order for that to become more and more clear. And it'll change, it'll shift, and that's okay, that's part of the process. But it won't happen until you start. That's true of nonprofits and businesses, all of it. You've got to start. Along this process, how have you surrounded yourself with resources or experts or mentors along the way? Has there been anything like that that's really helped you get this going? Because, I mean, you've built quite a large organization. You're doing a lot of work overseas. How have you started that foundation to get where you are? Absolutely. Teresa, that is a great, great question and such a pertinent one that anybody listening, please, please take note. 
Success leaves clues. When Walmart started out, they told Sam Walton, you are a fool. We do not need Walmart. We have Kmart. And he said he copied everything Kmart did until about 10 years in, he finally was at a point to where he could start doing things that were more what Walmart was going to do. Now, where is Kmart today? And where is Walmart? So we have taken clues from so many other big organizations because we're not looking to compete. We are looking to complete the work that needs to be done. But we get a lot of information. And so one is just going to other websites, pulling their 990s, pulling their audited statements and looking into that, how to organize it. But coaching is so essential. You need to have mentors and coaching. If you don't have the guide, how are you going to reach the destination? And so for me, personal growth is so important. I have been surrounding myself with people that are way ahead of me, way more knowledge than a nonprofit, and I pick their brain. I ask them questions. So some of the things that have been really helpful that are very practical is books. I'm a reader. I like to read about one book a week, and I purely like to read to learn. I feel so fulfilled just learning to make me better at my craft, nonprofit leader. Number two, Facebook groups for nonprofit leaders. If you're a grant writer, a Facebook group with grant writers. Um, if you're a nonprofit leader, we bounce so many things off of each other. Number three is being with the group. Um, the last couple of years, I was a part of a group here in New Jersey where 12 executive director nonprofit leaders would meet at a roundtable discussion. And We'd have speakers that would come and that was great, but I always felt what was best for me was collaborating with others. So it's one thing to be on top of the mountain. It's another thing to be on top of the mountain alone. You don't have to do this alone. And so, so many things that I wanted to move forward with, I'd research to another person that's already been there and get them to help me. And you know what? A lot of times they helped me. So I would make a donation to their organization. Nothing too crazy, maybe a hundred dollars, or I would attend their gala and then maybe get five hundred dollar gift. You know, if it was something that touched my heart and it, if it was something that I wanted to make an impact in, but that was a way to kind of give back to them because they gave me their time and their wisdom. And so, you have to find somebody where you can get that information from. So, a book, Facebook group, podcasts are great. I listen to several podcasts, I get so much information, and um you know, Facebook groups. That is so much good advice right there <laughs> in that whole last section. Mm. Yes, that's amazing. I see that as a common thread with the most successful leaders, I would say, with they read a lot, they network a lot and collaborate or almost mastermind with other leaders in the space too. And even with leaders in other spaces to learn from people in the business world in different career paths than yours because there's something to pick up on from each of those. Wow, lots of good advice. So tell us again, how long has your nonprofit been officially up and running? Yes, it has been 10 years. Okay. 10 years up and going. I first moved to India. I was a teacher. Like I said, I thought my career was set. I went to college. Last thing I wanted to do was learn or study anything else. And then I just felt in my heart that this is what I was made for, to impact these children's lives in India that were living in the slums and begging on the streets. It has gone so far beyond me. So I've been so fortunate. Like what an opportunity we have in the nonprofit realm to get paid for something, to impact some part of the world, to make it a better place for what we believe in. And we get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Really, I was just thinking about that this morning. My heart is touched. And, you know, I first went to India 2010, moved over there. I had a lot more questions than I did answers, but I knew my why. Why was I doing this? And today it has not changed. I'm still just as excited, just as expired. And there's reasons why, you know, why, how I stay inspired, how I stay excited to do this work and focus on the mission. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And that's such a good core 
thing to come back to is remembering your why, whether you're a nonprofit, a grant writer, a small business, whatever it is, coming back to that why, because that is what propels you. And as you were saying that, you know, I'm just thinking, what if you had said no? What if you had resisted that? What if you had said, oh, that's not practical enough. I don't have enough answers. I can't go that route. I mean, you wouldn't have made nearly the impact. You would have felt like a fish out of water, where now you are in your zone of genius. You're making a huge impact because you followed that draw to something bigger than yourself that honestly is very scary sometimes, but you kept after it and kept going for that. That's right. It all starts with the first step. You don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. Right. You don't have to have the answers and you don't have to know what kind of impact you're going to make. You just need to take that step. That's right. And Teresa, I'm just, something's just coming to mind that somebody's listening and they're starting out and they were like me when I started. And it's great to where, um, where we're at now. Uh, we have 53 staff in India. We're in over 20 different locations across the whole country. I've traveled all throughout the country of India. But how about when you start and you tell people your vision, your dream, and they're not getting it. So they're going to try to like corner you and question you. And so here's advice to somebody just starting out, or maybe even somebody like me that as I'm learning more and more boundaries, you don't have to explain yourself to these people. That's not healthy. You don't. You can tell them what you feel and that's it. If they try to push, it's probably because they're unhealthy emotionally in some ways, change the topic and just move on. Because some things you still might not fully explain and you can't expect them to do. And some people will push your buttons. You just don't over explain yourself. You don't have to. What good advice. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to over explain. Not everybody is going to get it and they don't need to. And that's where it comes back to your why and staying centered on your vision and going after that. That is amazing advice and so practical. It's one of those things that's so easy to say, but then when it comes down to it and you're in that situation, it's difficult. I think it just takes practice and really defining that over and over for yourself to stay clear. And I've found it helps to surround myself with people that are supportive of it and not in a raw, raw way, but that can help me bounce ideas or remind me of things or say, you know, that's not very clear. Are you sure that's the direction you want to go in more of an iron sharpens iron type of way? And that can help spur that on and challenge me and push me. Mm -hmm. One thing that has come up a lot with some of my grant writer discussion groups and also with nonprofits, you kind of alluded to this, is the idea of mentoring. And I'm trying to also remind people that mentor can be a one-on-one -on -one discussion with someone on a regular basis, but it can also be a podcast or books and people that you may never meet. Can you speak to that of if someone is looking for a mentor or feels like they're kind of lost and just needs someone to help guide them, what can they do in that regard? How do you approach someone about that? Or do you just kind of wait until you meet the right person that you feel like would be a good fit? Yes. Well, when a fisherman is looking for fish, where do they go? They go where the water's at, right? Because they know they're going to find fish. So if you're looking for a grant writer, if you're looking for a nonprofit leader to coach you and guide you, you need to go where they're at. Join the groups where they're at. First off, you need to put yourself in the right environment. And then as you find people, sometimes you can connect with people if it's a group of other nonprofit leaders. So let's say um, three years ago, I joined a group in New Jersey and some people I found out they were really excelled in certain areas. It was galas. It was dealing with uh, corporate sponsorships. So I could ask those people and talk to them. But, you know, they weren't always on call. So then there's some times where you actually have to pay people. And that wasn't a accredited group. So we do mission trips where we want to bring our child sponsors over to India. And we started this four years back. We started the mission trips. But we had, I had a lot of challenges because although I lived in India for six years, and know the work so well, but bringing people over from America and now 
living back in the office and processing that, it's the different challenges that are there. So we joined a group that does mission trips and they, you can get accredited. So then I was assigned a mentor. So when I would have challenges or questions, I would go to them. Now we paid for this and it was the best investment ever. And then also utilizing books. Uh, they were really good, but I always felt the best is talking to somebody, a real live person that can share their experiences, challenges, and the victories with you and encourage you. Like, okay, these are going to happen, but don't give up. Keep moving forward. That really does make a difference. And that's, I agree, that's where I've found the most value is the ones that can look at my situation and speak directly to that. The books are great and that's super helpful, but to have someone that I can just say, how should I move forward with this is incredibly valuable. That's right. Now, here's a quick example. I remember with one of my coaches, my mentors from a group that I had joined, and I was like, I have this problem and you know, here's the situation, so what should I do? She's like, okay, well, here's on one hand, here's the other. She's like, I'm not going to make the choice for you. But she's like, let me try to keep it simple. Which one would be less drama? <laughs> You're not going to get all that out of a book, you know? And I was like, wow. I was like, <laughs> answered. And I went and I made that choice. And really, it was just so great that I had a mentor and a coach that's been there so much, has so much more knowledge than me. And they're helping me out. Yes. Sometimes it just boils down to making it that simple. We try to make it so complicated in our head. We overthink all the possible angles. I say we, <laughs> I'm saying I do <laughs> for sure. And so sometimes it's just remembering, okay, there's really a simple choice here. If I take out all the stuff, what do I really want to do? And that can be the value of having someone to reflect that back to us. What's one big challenge that you're facing right now with the year we've just finished with 2020, looking at 2021? What is one big thing that you are wanting to tackle this year? Well, for us, our mission is to empower children in poverty in India to overcome the challenges that they have that keep them stuck. And in 2020, here we are, we have the kids in the center's they're getting the help they need. They're moving forward. Then all the doors were shut. And the government said, you can't have more than X number of people to meet and join. So it really set us back. And our biggest thing was to get all the centers back up and going when our first one in Mumbai opened back up in September. And then all the other ones followed suit shortly after within a month or two. So we really want to try to make up for lost ground because in India, for the kids that are in poverty, they don't have a laptop at home where they can go and do online school. They don't even have a cell phone. That's a smartphone to do online in school. I know it's hard to believe because it's, you know, it was 2020, but it's definitely a different way of life. So we want to get these kids with a robust education, get them back up to par. That's one of our big things we're focused on. Another thing is we are building a girl safe house for 70 girls, and we're focused on that, moving that forward. We want to finish that this year because we have a very urgent need to get girls into a safe environment where they'll live. Also, we're building a school there, and those are our challenges, but our focus is that I know we're going to be able to overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it such a compelling need and some clear things to focus on. I think that is probably what's helped you grow this large over the last 10 years is to really know where do we need to focus right now? Where do we want to go? We have our big vision, but what's next? And let's focus on that, grow that, and then we can move on to the next piece. Would you say that's been the case? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, there's a season for everything. So trying not to do too much in one season and trying to see where you're at, you know. So for us, we know in January, we're going to have the annual child sponsorship reports that go to all the sponsors. Now, that's a lot of work that has to get done. Then we have the tax receipts, which we do here in our office. So then we have to prepare that, send that out. And so trying not to do too much to get burned out, 
but to be efficient and move forward. Yes. And so what challenges have you found with trying to manage, you said 53 staff in India and you're in the States now, and I'm sure you have support staff here too. So what challenges do you have with just the communicating and not being able to travel? What does that look like for you right now? Yeah, well, I lived in India for six years. So my goal was always to put myself out of a job and to multiply. Really, you're greatest when you multiply. That's the one of the greatest signs of a leader that's often overlooked. Like, really, what do you think about the great leader? You think somebody that's calm, they're creative, they take risks, but people forget, multiply. So we always have to multiply. I got really good doing this work in India. I picked up two languages, which something I never thought would happen, but it just went with the territory where I worked. And so now we have directors in these areas. So I don't manage the staff under them. I work with the directors. And even sometimes when you're dealing with this many people, you know, you have to be firm, but the truth with love. Okay, that's nice. These staff want to talk to me, but you're the director. I just had a situation for a new director in Calcutta. And I said, that's nice. They want to talk to me, but you're the director. So I need you to communicate with them. And then you communicate with me. And since he was new, I was like, what is it in reference to? And it was something so simple. And I said, yeah, you can take care of that. And then we can discuss it. Because you have to limit your time where you're at. And it's not that I don't, care about the staff. I do, but you'll get so bogged down and burned out, even in the thing you're most passionate about. And so I'm learning to try to reserve my energy, my time, and to spread it out and learn from my mistakes too, where I've made those mistakes, you know, trying to work with too many people do too much, which I think we're all guilty of at times if if you're getting in a nonprofit world. Yes. And we want to help. We're here because we like helping. So it's easy to get caught up in that and to not set those boundaries or to feel guilty for setting healthy boundaries, like saying, okay, did you go to your director first about this? And even just that, teaching people how the system works, how they need to follow certain protocols and just how to handle situations that takes time up front to train them. But once they are, it flows much more smoothly. That's true. And you touched on a very important part for nonprofit leaders and that's healthy boundaries because I usually get phone calls at night, you know, way past office hours, Facebook messenger messages, uh, you know, about, things that are relating to child sponsorship and questions that I would have to look on databases in the office. And there was a time where I would try to do that at home. And then, you know, the family gets impacted. Like, why are you not focused with us? And you're focused over there. So now I've learned to adapt to healthy boundaries. And I've had people try to call me out. Hey, I've been calling you. I've been messaging you. Oh, I don't work on the weekends. I'm all in the office Monday through Friday for the set hours. Well, what do you mean? Yeah, that's my way to rest and recharge. Well, how long have you been doing that? See, now they're going to try to start getting, trying to make you feel guilty. Yeah, well, we can talk on Monday when I get back in the office. I'll get back to you. There you go. That's a good point because I think we're more and more connected with smartphones, with gadgets all the time, everywhere we go, people come to expect that and they expect what you allow. So if you keep allowing that, they're going to just want that instant response. But if you set those boundaries, just like if there's, you know, your lawyer's office, it's open eight to five, Monday to Friday or whatever their hours are, that's when you can reach them, not on the weekends. So Just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you can't have those boundaries. And sometimes people forget that or they assume, oh, I should be able to reach them 24-7. But we're human. We need sleep. We have families. (laughs) We have lives outside of our work. And you're absolutely right. Just because it's a passion doesn't mean you shouldn't take a break from it sometimes too because burnout is a huge thing in the nonprofit world. And I think people really need that reminder to take that time to rest and to be deliberate about it. 
So good. Well, as we wrap up, you've mentioned you do a lot of reading, studying, listening, share a resource that has been meaningful to you in particular. So many good ones. I would say something that's been good for me, because I already mentioned so many other things, uh, resources, but something that's been really good is to go back once a year and to watch the movie Slumdog Millionaire, because that was the mission. That's how it is. Somebody in the office just told me the other day, they said, oh, you know, I see organizations, they get confused with the mission. And I said, that's right. What you said is so important that we always have to stay focused. Our mission is our North Star. That is always the North Star, where we're heading to. And I've seen organizations, they get so off course that they, like their names don't even match them anymore. They don't even have anything to do with that because they've lost the North Star. So for me to go back and watch Slumdog Millionaire brings me back to 2009. And when when I was thinking, like, what was it that really touched me to the point I was ready to leave my job, my salary, my health benefits? I didn't get anything. I started the organization. So I had to go ask people to give money to do this. And, and what what was it? What touched me? And what was it in that movie that I wanted to impact and make different for those kids' lives? It really helps me to watch that. So whatever it is that got you started, if it was something that was clear, um, maybe it was a person you were talking to, to go back and talk to them and saying, hey, listen, you know, you were the person that inspired me to get into this animal shelter work or Maybe it was something that you can touch upon. Go back to that and remember what it was you set out to do. Because when you get in the nonprofit world and when you grow, you are going to have so many things that can come and distract you from the mission. Finances, bookkeepers, CPAs, finance reports, custom-made Excel documents, custom-made databases. There are so many things that I have had to learn how to deal with staff in India, how do you set boundaries with donors, how to utilize social media marketing. And there's so many things that are going to come and try to clutter that one thing that you have to channel into and remember your North Star, your mission. And that was your why. What a good reminder. And when you start feeling overwhelmed or discouraged, it's good to keep coming back to that and just kind of come back to home base and remember that. And then that sort of helps handle the stress and realize, like you said earlier, which parts are important, which parts we can cut out and where we need to focus. So much good information here. (laughs) I'm going to have to go back and take notes myself. Thank you so much. Where can people connect with you online if they want to learn more about you or if they are interested in possibly a sponsorship even or how they can support your work? Uh, Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Go to loveneverfailsindia.com and you'll find a lot of information about how we're making an impact and how you can join us to impact something that's near and dear to your heart. And also you can see the beautiful little kids that are waiting for a sponsor has their pictures, their bio information and anything you would need to sign up and sponsor them. What a great way for donors to feel connected to the work they're doing and to really know that they're truly making an impact when they can visibly see that step-by-step of how it's changing that child's life. Really, I always thought it was the greatest investment. It's a lot of work administration-wise to manage a child sponsorship program that has a high standard, which ours is. You know, we really want to see these letters go out timely and the responses and really connect them. But when you're getting that letter and the pictures of the kid, um, let's say we had a girl, Isha. She lives in a slum in a little tin shack. Well, her sponsor was like, I want to do something really special. Can you give a suggestion? So the staff asked her and she said, I've always had a dream to have a refrigerator. Now Isha is 14, but never had a refrigerator and she bought it for her. And let me tell you, I was there when we got to break the news. I was in India just recently in December and we broke the news to Isha. She was jumping up and down. It was like an refrigerator, but 
when the sponsor got the pictures back then, the way she contacted the office, she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. This is so unbelievable. She was like, I want to buy her something else. She bought her a bicycle. So you see, because it's real, you're seeing the impact and they're getting the thank you letter. It's a great investment. Oh my, it sure is. And those things are things we take for granted every single day. We don't even think twice about having a refrigerator or a bike in the garage. And to them, it's such a joy for them to get. So what an amazing connection you are making and that you are allowing people to make that they couldn't do themselves. But by making that connection, you're allowing the donors to make a difference and you're making a huge difference for these kids that otherwise would have no resource to do that themselves. That's awesome. Thank you for the work you're doing. And thank you for the wealth of knowledge you've shared today. This has been amazing. Well, thank you, Teresa. Really, I really appreciate the work that you're doing in your heart to help nonprofit leaders and nonprofits to grow and reach the level of excellence that they want to be at. Well, thank you. We will stay in touch and talk to you soon. Friends, if this has left you feeling like it's time to step up and do more, but you don't know where to start, check out the Fast Track to Grant Writer at TeresaHuff.com slash VIP. Incidentally, it includes all the tips for success that Jonathan mentioned. Always be learning, network in Facebook groups, and be with a small group to collaborate and bounce ideas off of each other. And then going back to your why. Check out the Fast Track to Grant Writer today at TeresaHuff.com slash VIP. We've got a world to change and we need you to be a part of it. If you love this show and you learn something new about being the type of grant writer the world needs so you can create a ripple in your community, please go leave me a review over on Apple Podcasts today. Thanks for listening. Now go change your world.